June 11, 2020, uh, study session of the Bloomfield Hills Board of Education. Uh, Secretary, take attendance. Uh, I think all board members are present. Is is Jackie here? I saw her. Let's see if she's in the participant. Jackie, I saw her enter. Mm. So maybe she just had problems and she'll re-enter any minute now. So I think right now, no, but she was in like at 558, so. Okay. All right, um, there's no public comment. Um, with that, we will go to the study session agenda. And first on it is Paul Wills from Plant Moran that's gonna give us an enrollment projection report. Go, Paul. Thank you, President Colin, and good evening, board members and administrative team. Uh, again, this is our uh, annual presentation of the pupil enrollment presentations. And I'll pull up our screen here. If everyone can see that, let me know. Yep, I see it. Uh, Perfect. It's on the screen, yep. Okay, good. So again, this is our annual presentation uh, to the Bloomfield uh, Hill Schools relative to the pupil enrollment projections. I do want to say thanks again to Tina and Sandra for all their work uh, over the last several months, taking a look at during these challenging times of uh, putting together the enrollment projection information for us to allow those student enrollment projections for the district. Um, I want to talk a little bit about demographic trends. Um, you know, last year in 2018-19, uh, the live birth rate is still on a descending uh, rate, if you will. It's really about half of what it was in 1957. Um, so even though you're seeing uh, a lot of people moving into the district, which uh, is great, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the birth rates and, and, again, some of the challenges and also some of the opportunities that the district has been seeing over the last several years. Um, but in terms of the birth rate, um, there's no real uh, uptick, um, although some joke, maybe after this quarantine, we'll see a, a nine to 10 months from now, maybe there'll be a little switch in there, but we'll see. So the way Plant Moran Crested does enrollment projections is we actually take a look at the geographical information systems. Uh, the black polygon you see on your screen is actually the district's boundaries. Uh, the district is a uh, closed boundary, which means it is not a school of choice, uh, similar to all of our clients uh, here without, throughout the state. We're looking at the U.S. Census Bureau, so hopefully everyone filled out your census information in uh, the spring of 2020. Uh, we're also looking at things such as labor and bureau statistics. Um, we're looking at postal addresses, et cetera, going forward. So it's not just a one point of information. We take a look at what's happening in the district as a whole. Uh, we compare that also to Oakland County, as well as to what's happening in the state of Michigan. And as I mentioned, we're looking at your DS4061 forms, uh, which again, I do appreciate the people accounting office and all their efforts to get that information going forward. We're going to talk a little bit in the presentation about the three different methodologies. So method one is a six year average uh, for the district. Method two is really a look at the last two years. And you'll see some variance uh, from those two numbers. And then method three is really the average of the method one and method two going forward. As I mentioned with the birth rate uh, throughout the state of Michigan, this is specifically to Oakland County. And so one of the things you'll see here is the current K-12 cohort really in that uh, 2002 to really 2014, 15 year, uh, you can see the decline of roughly 15,000 or 14,612 uh, outgoing, you know, really that senior class. And then really the, the birth rate in Oakland County has really leveled off for roughly 13,000. As I mentioned, it's continued to go down to roughly 13,152 in the last two years. So again, about um, 2,000 kids less over a 10 year period. And so then the question is, is, you know, as a district, how can we maintain our, our enrollment and capture maybe some of these additional uh, moves in into the districts going forward? So one of the things we look at is uh, within that black, black polygon. So this is one of the demographic sheets. Uh, you'll see that there is a total of 11,505 families in that first column, of which there's 15,749 total households. The median age of the household is actually 60.6. So again, uh, not a lot of zero to fives or six to uh, 11 year olds coming out of that demographic. Out of those number of households, there's 5,199 that actually have school aged children. So this would be uh, PK through 12. And of that, uh, roughly um, the year, the median year they moved in is actually 2007. So again, um, very uh, similar to some other districts that we have in terms of aging demographics and, and populations. 
looking at the same information a little bit differently. Um, we're looking at the kind of the, the, the decrease, if you will. So as we mentioned, that zero to five is really about a 3.3%. You'll see on the right-hand side of variance in the next five years. Um, it's roughly 2.5. So again, we are seeing not as much as a decrease at that elementary middle school, because again, people are moving into Bloomfield uh, Hill Schools District. Um, that 12 to 17 year old cohort, about roughly a 4% decrease. And then the 18 to 24 year olds, there's actually, uh, those are the students that um, have graduated, moved on outside of the district's boundaries themselves. We take a look at the population trend by age groups. So again, as a district, uh, you'll see that zero to five, um, that's your uh, blue diamonds here at the bottom. So in 2010, there's 1,847. Roughly, it's leveled off at about 16,000 or 1,650, um, just slightly down from 1,700. You'll see that the 12 to 17 year olds, again, this is that cohort that you're seeing currently in the system that'll be graduating. Um, so again, this is the population trend groups as it relates to the schools currently in the system. So we take a lot of the demographic information. We really take uh, a really hard look at the pupil enrollment piece themselves. And so again, as I mentioned, we look at the geographical information systems, the demographic sourcing. Uh, we also look at your FTEs. So again, we're gonna talk about headcount and FTEs uh, relative to the projections. And then we compare that to the county live births uh, relative to Bloomfield Hills capture of those incoming kindergarten students going forward. So this sheet, um, it's a little hard to read, but if you see in the academic year 2012, again, this is the way that the district reports their uh, spring and fall counts. So again, you'll see both fall and spring uh, over the last seven years to kind of give you some historical perspective. This does get audited by the state of Michigan. Uh, so again, this is how you get your foundation um, counts. And again, this is a blended count with a 90% weight on the fall count and a 10% uh, weight on the current uh, spring count. So again, thank you again for the Office of Pupil Accounting for providing this information. So we take this information, everything from this thick black line, if you see the thick black line, everything to the left of that is your historical data. So again, this isn't something that Plemmer and Cress is making up or anything else. So if we start in the upper left-hand corner here, the 2008 birth year, you'll see that there was 13,799 live births in Oakland County. When you look at the kindergarten incoming of 309 students, that represents roughly 2.24% of those 13,799 eligible students for that year. The good news is if you fast forward to 2019-20 school year, you've actually increased almost to 2.9% uh, relative to the capture rate, so just above 390. Uh, what you'll see though is that the birth rates actually dropped by over 300 students and again that birth rate is going to continue to drop to roughly 13 30, 21 here in the next five years the way the cohort system works if you take a look at the previous year so it kind of works on a diagonal system you had 327 students in kindergarten in 2018-19 if you go down to the next calendar year you had uh, 339 which is a growth of roughly 3.54 percent so one of the things we're doing is looking at each individual year. So if I continue down that same concept, get a 3% growth from kindergarten to first, 5.82% growth from first to second. You're over 100% all the way down, inclusive of almost down to uh, 12th grade. So again, there's a little bit of anomaly here in, in the 11th grade. And some of that is just those students that may not necessarily be in that four-year high school track. Um, the good news as a district is you've, basically leveled off with enrollment. So from a projection standpoint, the district will be roughly 5,300 students for the next five years uh, at the K-12 level. When you take a look at special ed as well as the, uh, the non-relief students, the total general uh, population within the district is roughly 5,575. Um, but then again, you see some of those decreased uh, enrollments here for um, special ed and some of those will get you down to roughly 5,445. So really this enrollment projection is used for two things. One is for uh, uh, financials, which I know is later on the agenda. Uh, the other is actually just looking at your capacity. So again, as you're planning the, the bond in, in August, um, and again, looking at you know, the, the, cap the capacities of each of those facilities, this is a great planning tool to really help you look in that five-year window going forward. We put that information in a similar graph. So again, um, K-5, now remember, um, this is your orange triangles here. 
Um, so we're roughly 2276 going up to roughly 2300. So even though the birth rate has dropped, you are still experiencing families moving into the district, which is allowing you to keep it roughly at 2300 students in the, by, in the next five years. At the 6-8 level, so again, a slight dip, uh, down to about 1185. That's going to continue back up to about 1288 and then start to dip back again in the 2828 timeframe. At the high school level, um, again, this is uh, FTE. So this includes students that may not necessarily be at the high school themselves. Um, so again, roughly 1844, and then it slides, slightly dips down to about 1685 in 2025. And it slowly starts to pick back up once that middle school cohort kind of carries through in those in the next five to seven years. So when we talked about method one, method two, um, oftentimes we get the questions of, you know, what was the accuracy from last year to this year? Um, over the last five years, we've been around 99.4%. Um, I know it varies from year to year. One year we we're off by one or two percent up, and then one year we were one or two percent down. Uh, but holistically, um, we're in that 98 to 99 percent range. Um, the question we ask now is, you know, what happens in the fall if there's no in-person schools? Um, that's the question that we get to ask a lot of our questions. And again, a lot of districts are looking at some modified. So again, if it's an online uh, virtual type academy where you'd still get those credits for those students. Um, you look at the K-5 or even the K-6, K-7 of, again, the social distancing with, you know, kids not transferring in between classrooms, et cetera. So again, I just want to kind of pre preface that in terms of the enrollment projections we're showing here is showing that you know programs would still continue similarly what they've done previously uh, again understanding that the bloomfield hills schools would still offer um, obviously either in person or online or some combination of both relative to um, the k-12 programs so with that i will turn it back over to uh, president colin and the board for any questions um i know howard has a question i also have a question howard um yes uh thank you paul for the Wonderful presentation. Um, obviously, we have uh, COVID-19 that's going to impact a lot of things going on in education. Um, in terms of student enrollment, I'm thinking the good news is because we're in a recession that there are parents possibly who would consider not sending their children to private schools anymore because of the expense and sending them to um, uh, public schools. On the bad news side for us, uh, you might have some parents very apprehensive about uh, educating their kids in an, a, a, uh, an environment like a school and uh, might consider homeschooling instead. Um, do you take either of those considerations uh, or issues into consideration in your, uh, in your modeling? So for this model, we have not. And, and the reason being is we don't have any data points of what that looks like. So one of the things we've done with some other district is you know, hey, what if we decide not to be a closed district anymore? Or what if we decide to no longer accept schools of choice over a certain period of time? We can create various models. Um, the good news is that uh, the district has experienced the same amount of public capture rates for those students over the last three or four years, which actually is great news for the district because you're pulling that half a point or one point away from the uh, private schools, if you will. The question is, would you see another 1% potentially go to that homeschool model? Again, we have a lot of districts looking at how do you offer a virtual academy to basically maintain those students that maybe some of the private schools are not offering at this time. So I know as a district, you know, those are things that from a curriculum standpoint, uh, you may be looking at in terms of, you know, how do I offer that, uh, that online experience for our kids and still be able to count those foundations. So to answer you directly, we have not included any scenarios um, for either a significant increase or a significant uh, decrease due to COVID. Um, obviously, we'd love an opportunity to work with, you know, the district and administrative level to give you some options of, and, and again, Sandra's done a phenomenal job. So, I mean, she could probably very quickly with Tina, you know, what would a, a 50 student look like, uh, either increase or decrease? But um, at this point, it's just hard to project uh, hard of, of what that could potentially look like until it happens in the fall. Because you have access to so many different districts around the state, do you know whether any districts have, because, uh, have done any surveys of the parents? to find out what the, the feel is and whether uh, we could be looking for an increase or a decrease next year because of that? So um, out of the 12 districts I'm currently working with, they're all in the process of sending out those surveys as we, as we speak. Um, again, the state came out with their budget recently, so obviously that's gonna have a huge impact of what potential they could be looking at uh, for some of those programs. So again, 
Um, a lot more information will be probably available in the next 30 days. Um, and by all means, I'd love to share that with uh, Superintendent Watson and ultimately the board if you know we get some information that's public knowledge from other districts of what they're doing. Um, I, I just know from a perspective of parents, um, you know, my daughter's going to be a senior this year at BH High School, and she really wants to be in that classroom come September 3rd. And, and again, from, from a parenting standpoint, again, I can't speak for all parents, but, um, you know, this online learning thing, it's, it's been, I think the district's done a phenomenal job. Um, I think you have a small percentage, though, that, again, would want 100% virtual experience. Um, and others that, you know, they, they rely on the district for not more than just education. It's, you know, you know, having somewhere to have your kids for, you know, from eight o'clock in the morning till three or four in the afternoon is, is kind of another requirement. So uh, I, I do encourage you again, I, I know you guys are in the process and my wife and I have filled out plenty of surveys to kind of give you our feedback, but I think the more information you get from parents will help you strategize as a district what Bloomfield looks like in the fall. Paul, what is the percentage this year of uh, private school enrollment that you have in your model? Uh, we have the uh, 23 and a half percent, which is a half point lower than it was two or three years ago. In the so same way, yeah, yeah. yeah. So again, you know, you look at a, a half a point though, that's you know 40, 50 kids um you know pretty quickly, which is great for the district from a financial and foundation standpoint. But um it, again, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, I know a lot of parents are looking even at the college level of you know, I don't want to send my kids out of state tuition if they're gonna be online learning in the fall. So, you know, hey OCC, you know, I've been working with Pete Provenzano of what that potentially looks like on some of their six campuses. Um, obviously, they have a huge online presence. And so it's not just the K-12, it's the community college universities that are looking at that uh, type of exposure for their students. Thank you very much. So before we go to Lisa, Lisa has a question. I have a, so I'm just a little confused in the, these methods. So what is our final enrollment? Is it 5319 or 5239? What is our final actual 2019 enrollment and then where what is the makeup of whatever the difference is whether it's 60 110 51 88 where are that where are the those extra students high level coming from is it all private schools or is it just give me give me an idea of where the extra numbers came from yeah so from an extra uh number standpoint let me um where to go here i was just presenting it it's well, it's on the screen right now. I see um, okay. two, an actual K3 number of 5319 and one says 5239. Um, you know, I just want to know what the final number is and whatever whatever the the difference is. And I'm not interested in whether it's 110, but wh where are those, you know, in terms of the discrepancy? What is it? Did we get more private school students that came to us or people that moved in from overseas? I'm just curious as to what's, you know, what caused yeah. the difference? Yeah, so I, I know there's that half percent difference from last year to this year. So there was some private uh, capture uh, to the public. The rest of those would have been people moving into the district since you're a uh, closed district. So again, even though the birth rate's down, um, you're experiencing um, some of the benefit of people, you know, being able to move into the Bloomfield Hill schools. I don't have the exact number, Paul, in terms of um, you know, who's right. private and who's, who's uh, moving into the district, but and, and I guess, and I don't know who has it, whether it's you or Tina, and I know I've, I've, this is a point of emphasis. How many students from 2018 to 2019 did we lose to private schools? Actually, you gained um, from that we, percentage standpoint. So we gained. Um, all right. But how many students left our district to go to private schools um, last year? Not not how many, let's say 400 came back. How many? How many went out? I'd, that'd probably be like part of the exit interview um, process if you're sending transcripts. Um, so I guess and, that'd have to be through and, the people accounting office. Okay, and I guess I go to that, and I don't know Tina, and I don't think Shira is on. I'm I'm still trying. I'm still struggling with the people that are going out. You know, going through the exit interviews. What are the reasons people are leaving? That's something I've been asking for. Um, for a while, and I'd, I'd like to start getting an analysis of, of that, of why people are leaving and how many we could potentially save. Again, I don't know if anyone on the call has, you know, um, who's been working on it. I know people, you know, I know we started working on it. It's a question I've raised. It's a question I would like to dig deep into, especially during these times, to analyze and what we can do to, to save students. You know, I, I'm granted, I'm sure our family ambassadors and that team, 
along with I've seen Pat on some calls trying to get people into the district that, you know, I'm just trying to curious people going out. What are the reasons, a breakdown of the reasons and what we can do to try to save them? So I guess that's not a question that people can answer. That's just something that I, I'd like to discuss in the future. And this is not just Paul. This is something that we've requested as a board for a number of years. Obviously, you know, in October, it's still the numbers are fluid. By the time we get to, though, December or January, we need to get a year over year analysis of what the student count is this year versus last year and what the differences are. That really is something we've been asking for a number of years now. Anyway, that, that's yeah, that's fine. If no one an answer, you know, I could we could discuss it more offline. Lisa, you had a question. Hi, Paul. Um, Hi. My question is, we've talked a lot about right sizing um, buildings throughout the district, and I know that our elementary schools in particular are different sizes, square footage and number of classrooms. Do you have any idea um, if there's going to be students moving into the district or growth in number of students, what part of the district is going to see uh, the majority of that and, and maybe to help inform us of sizes and where to move students uh, in the event that the bond either does or does not pass? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I was able to actually be part of the strategic planning process um, with Todd and and the team and actually a lot of the community presentations. So right now we're seeing a lot of the growth kind of in the northeast quadrant of the district, uh, as well as kind of the center, um, south center of the district. So I guess from an existing feeder standpoint, it'd be that east over Conant, um, you know, uh, enrollment. Uh, I, knew, I do know looking at some of the potential boundary changes if the bond uh, was to be passed and some of those adjustments that would take place as, as buildings come online. Um, that is not uncommon for that to happen, especially when you start looking at capacities. Um, so the good news is, you know, we've given you that five to six year window, um, which does, again, we've broken it down kind of by, by area, if you will, plus district wide. Um, so from a planning tool, you know, it's, it's great that I think you're looking at some of the middle schools being converted into that elementary level. Again, it gives you some of that flexibility and capacity and inequality, which is great. Um, so again, that'll just be one of those parts of those tools, uh, really when you start looking at curriculum offerings. Um, but again, from an overall standpoint, the, the district still has capacity, but it's just not in the right spot. Right. Um, so I know with the you know fourth grades moving up, you know at East and, and West Hills, you know my son, you know and daughters, and you know they went through BH Middle School, and I think there's 800 kids in the building at the time. And you know, and I was talking to Randy English, I'm like, you know, this computer lab could probably still be a, you know, a general ed classroom, and he's like, don't push it, you know, it'd be over 900 kids. But uh, no, it's really at the end of the day that this is really used as that help the, help that planning tool, as I mentioned. Um, so again, that that northeast quadrant, kind of the center of the district on the southern end, are the two where we're seeing the most transitions of housing. The um, there was a slide a long time ago that showed the flow of students in the event that we had to keep the same building, same capacity of the buildings. That took into account your projection numbers. I didn't realize you were on the strategic planning committee. I'm sorry, the uh, master property planning and okay, okay. <laughs> sorry, got to up. all right. So those numbers were incorporated into the numbers of where you would move students. The projection numbers were incorporated into those. Numbers. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Thank you. You bet. Um, I don't see any other questions from our board. Uh, Paul, thanks for presenting. You could stay on, not stay on, but I'm assuming you want to um, jump off. <laughs> Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tina, who's going to give us a budget update. Thanks, everybody, and have a great evening. Thank you. Yep, bye-bye. All right, just making sure everyone can see my screen. Thumbs up, Paul. All right. Yes, we see it. Um, yep. Thank you. Um, so the, the budget update I have tonight is going to look at this year's final budget projection. Uh, in Novus, you have the final budget package. Um, I don't expect to make any changes to that for the June 25th recommended final budget. We will go over the changes since mid-year, mid-year to final for this year. 
And also um, in Novus for the board, you have the uh, working draft of budget balancing actions. So historically, uh, we've shared this in person, uh, usually in a piece of paper. So I provided this to the board. It is still confidential in process um, because some of the items on there we are, we are working through. But this also shares with you what is planned for uh, being included in next year's budget and beyond. And then we are going to look at some of the scenarios we are working on for the original budget for next year. So moving on for this year's final, uh, this year's final budget, uh, this particular slide shows everyone the original, the mid-year and the last column is today's date uh, with the latest. The most significant change, if you go to the general fund fund balance end of year row, uh, this, the decrease from mid-year till now includes a $700 per pupil reduction because at this point, uh, we do not have any better information from the state or the feds on any monies that may help offset that shortfall that the state has in the school aid fund budget. So $700 per pupil, which is about $3.9 million is included in this year's final budget recommendation. And I don't know whether we will hear anything in the next um, 10 days before I have to give you a recommendation for June 25th. The end result in the bottom right corner is 18.5% fund balance. The next page, there are two pages that go through the changes since mid-year. We started mid-year with revenue over expenditures of almost $600,000. And then we have a couple of key changes right off the bat. Uh, local revenue with the shutdown, eliminated revenue for rentals and preschool, uh, different things like that. Um, us actually charging for bus charters, but most of that's rentals and preschool is the largest one, uh, just over a million dollars. And then the next item is, I already mentioned, $3.9 million. I see I do have a typo in there that's supposed to be 5,554 and a half FTEs. So I'll correct that for June 25th. Um, that's very close to what Paul was just sharing as far as the historical data on FTEs, and that is how we are paid. The CARES Act and FEMA, I'm including that line, even though there's no net impact, just to share with you the amount of revenue so far offset by expenditures. And we continue, FEMA is actually a 75% reimbursement. We don't have word on that. We continue to collect the cost. So uh, we are very closely watching for any opportunities we have. Medicaid reimbursement, um, additional funds, that actually lags behind uh, just based on reporting. And so we're still collecting monies from 2018. That's just the way the world works with Medicaid reimbursement. Idea increased funding is actually uh, extra funding for um, existing expenditures. So that did have a net impact this year. And then staff compensation, I broke out two bullets because I wanted to show you the salary and wage decrease, which we would expect just based on uh, some of the hourly and different different positions that weren't paid and also just better than the mid-year estimate, as opposed to the benefits, which is uh, additional cost, because we wait till the final budget to look at everyone's elections and how the hard cap uh, change affects the budget. And it was an increase this year. So between that, and every year we have some UAAL adjustment. Um, the net effect is actually a negative impact of about 151,000. And then on the next page, we have some items, um, most of which, actually all of which are, uh, I would say primarily attributable to the shutdown and COVID. Uh, we did save on utilities as we would expect, gas, electricity, and water. And I know Brian and his team, you know, worked hard along with, you know, IT, making sure things were shut down. And those savings are a result of a lot of those efforts. Fuel, gas, oil, and grease. Uh, think transportation, buses, and, and even the other uh, vehicles that we utilize. There's a savings there. Um, supplies. Um, a lot of those supplies in, in uh, physical plants, even um, custodial cleaning supplies and district-wide by building. Uh, there was a net saving. 
And then lastly, a large amount for purchases, contracted services. Um, this, the majority of that will be custodial. I think that was 200 and some thousand, maybe approaching 300, and then also use of subs, uh, conferences that were canceled, things of that nature. And that brings us to the $3.1 million loss that we're projecting this year. That includes that $3.9 million reduction of $700. The next section I have is the development of the budget for next year. And uh, first are the millage rates. So millage rates every year are developed and actually the board in consent agenda a couple of meetings ago um, approved me to finalize those and get those to our municipality. Uh, the clerks and the county really appreciate getting this in time uh, rather than scrambling for the July 1 levy since we levy 50% of our taxes in the summer and then 50% uh, for the December 1 levy. The non-homestead 18 mills is part of our general operating along with homestead. And I'm still using the old terminology, non-homestead and homestead, uh, but now it's actually primary residence and non-primary residence is, is more of the technical term, depending on if you look at your tax bill. Um, the hold harmless is the homestead, that's the 6.9091. Commercial property is just a small amount, and then all classifications of property pay debt service, which right now is the high school bond, as well as the sinking fund that was approved in May of 2018 as a replacement. Um, one thing I like to mention, it's not noted here, is the sinking fund is subject to Headley rollback. So the replacement mills that were approved, 0.7165, because the total revenue we would collect next year is increasing greater than inflation, we're forced to roll back the rate. So that way the additional revenue we collect doesn't exceed inflation. And that's a permanent rollback. We don't get that back. Um, other than that, I was going to also mention the asterisks that are on here, uh, the hold harmless rate in particular is a flat amount per pupil. It's almost $4,000 per pupil and times FTE for the enrollment. Since we don't know our final enrollment until October, uh, we actually revisit the, with the best numbers we have in September uh, for the December 1 levy, um, but it's always looking at that flat about 4,000 per pupil times the FTEs. It's, it's capped, not changed since proposal A passed in 1994. And every year at this time, we actually look back a year. And if we over or under levied a little bit, then we adjust the rate. So we're never collecting more than that almost $4,000 of hold harmless per pupil. Uh, thanking all of our residents and taxpayers for continuing to renew that when we come back to them. General fund assumptions, these are in process. There are key considerations and we're working on, um, unlike other years, I'm working on three different scenarios that I plan to bring to you. A best, a middle, and a worst. Uh, the, the middle is what I am targeting for a recommendation. So right now, these aren't written in stone, uh, but based on the crest of projections, as Paul mentioned, it's based on birth rates, it's based on coming back to school, having being able to count all of our children, regardless of how they are learning, whether it's virtual, hybrid, uh, in person. That would be the best uh, scenario that I would use for enrollment. Um, the middle is um, going to be maintaining or slightly decreased right now, the way um, I'm looking at estimating. And a worst would be maybe taking a 25% or 20% decline in enrollment. So those, these are the, the decisions that are in process in order to show you different scenarios and then ultimately have a budget recommendation with the multi-year for, forecast. Um, obviously before the 25th. Foundation allowance per pupil, that is going to be key. So this year, the budget shortfall at the state level uh, is estimated 650, 700 numbers right around there continue to be tossed out. We don't yet know what the uh, state will decide as far as use of their rainy day money. They are allowed to use some of those. We don't know if some of those will be used, some of the monies will be used for the school aid fund. Uh, we don't yet know if additional federal funds will come to help uh, the shortfall uh, due to COVID. 
And we don't know whether any of the state's decisions on um, helping with budget balancing actions will positively impact that shortfall as well. Um, so I'm hoping um, that the $700 is the, is the worst case. And in these scenarios, um, the best case for us would be that all of the reduction that we're taking in this year, and we're almost to the end of June, um, would be recovered next year with no new reductions. And, and that might be a little optimistic, but it depends. It depends on between federal money and but during the recession, we had federal money coming in uh, to offset the shortfall, so we don't know. And then in the middle, I'm, I'm looking at maybe recovering half of that next year. So we would maintain that hit this year and then um, get half of that back next year, perhaps. And the worst would be no recovery at all. And we have two years that we're living with that reduced revenue amount. The, I already went through that one. Let me see. On the local revenue side, um, depending on where we are as far as reopening and um, starting to resume activities such as um, rentals. Uh, I know we talk about indoor rentals, outdoor rentals, uh, maybe outdoor might happen before indoor. Uh, so depending on where we're at, um, I have a best, middle, and worst because there's a good um, chunk of our local revenue that was impacted uh, by canceling everything. And so perhaps depending on those different levels, we're looking at that as well. Uh, we also have our farm and nature center that operate um, primarily for learning. They're gems in our community and, and really enhance learning and instruction for our students. But at the same time, we've recognized that there are many different community program type opportunities uh, for our residents. And so those those operate a little separate from uh, what we use those properties for, for education. And perhaps, you know, we, as, as time goes and we know more, uh, we might be able to offer usage uh, for some of the programs on those properties. Federal funding is the biggest, the biggest unknown. So I'm very curious to see what happens uh, by September. There will be another revenue estimating conference in August um, that I'm hearing about. And so we'll know more then, but obviously it's after the budget needs to be adopted. On the expenditure side, um, the expenditure side is more of under our control. Um, a lot of, obviously we're a people organization. So staffing is subject to bargaining for the majority of all of our staff. Uh, and most of those are in process, not yet ratified or approved. So it's nothing that I am putting in here. I know we've had um, a closed session on negotiations and more will be discussed in probably another one. Uh, the retirement rate is, and the healthcare cost changes are not under our control as much as everything else. So we have a good chunk of uh, costs that are not staff related. And so we're looking really hard at that. And some of those you will see in that budget balancing list that's a confidential draft in process for you to review and ask questions about at, at a future point. Then if we go to the next slide. So the next step for the June 25th board meeting with documents available in advance is to finalize the original budget detail package, which is gonna look very much like the final one that's included in Novus tonight, uh, but for next year for general fund and all special revenue funds, finalizing those forecast scenarios and also uh, preparing the public hearing presentation with the tax rates as required by law. And that'll be a special presentation at the beginning. And then we have transparency requirements and we use, a, there's a Munetric fiscal score. So I'll be analyzing the impact of all of this on the score. Um, many Michigan school districts I know and the colleagues I've spoken with are very concerned about what may or may not happen with funding. And that's all I have. I will turn it back to you for questions, comments. Uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a question before I go to, um, I know Howard has one. So Tina, what, um, what we're going to be approving, assuming nothing happens, um, this is it going to be with a $700 reduction? And is that what other districts are doing that need to approve the budget? Is that a best practice? I'm just trying to understand what, what are we going to be approving 
in terms of a budget? I know you've given us, which is great, different scenarios, you know, just for our benefit. But what, what do we need to approve and what's the best practice? So on June 25th, you will be approving the final budget for this year. And that is where $700 per pupil reduction is included because it's this year's state budget that has the shortfall. As far as the best practice, I have had um, more than numerous calls with uh, MSBO and colleagues as well. And the majority of everyone's best practice is including that this year because the state has to fix that shortfall. They, they cannot uh, accept or leave a deficit budget. So okay. the okay. option they have absent anything is to just do a proration. That's one option. And it would impact us this year. And so, so other districts you're saying is going to use the $700 per pupil reduction based on guidance. And that's what people across the state as a general rule, as a best practice, are going to be adopting. The majority of everyone I'm talking to is 600, 650, 700, all in that okay. ballpark. Um, and then there are there are some that I think don't want to take their general fund into a deficit, and they're um, doing they're they're hoping something happens and they're doing it next year. But th those are very few. So I'm just okay. letting you know I've seen it across the board, but the majority are doing what we're doing. Okay, great. Thank you for getting um, doing doing that research uh, for us and doing a best practice. Okay, I'll go with Howard and Jennifer. Howard. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you Tina, for for presenting. Um, so you just mentioned that um, based on what you're hearing from MSBO, that um, it's possible that there's going to be a, a flat proration. All districts get the same amount of money uh, taken out of their budget, similar to what happened in 2012. Correct. Yes, that is what I'm hearing. On the last big call we had, that is where we are at. So is it possible though, because again, proration comes through the Department of Treasury in Lansing, but is it possible the legislature would do a negative categorical? Uh, yes, that is a possibility too. We don't know how it'll happen, so I just call it a $700 per pupil reduction in some yeah, form. And not, not a category, I use the wrong word, a, supp a negative supplemental. Because negative if, supplemental, if they, yep. If they do a negative supplemental, they might, and that's up to the legislature and the governor, they might give a negative 2x. And if they do a negative 2x, while the average is 700, we might be hit harder, uh, possibly even double what the average is. Is that, uh, is that a possibility? Howard, that is that is also a possibility. That's not where the majority have landed, uh, including those that would be impacted by 2x. But you're not. You you are correct. That's a possibility as well. So um, has that discussion, especially amongst the hold harmless districts and the districts um, that are above minimum foundation allowance, have you had any discussions with those districts? I understand, you know, because. The vast majority, you know, 80 to 90 percent are at the minimum foundation allowance. But the ones that are above minimum foundation, in particular, hold harmlesses, um, is it? Have you had any conversations with those districts or MSBO in terms of whether that's a possibility, and if or and if it's a either a possibility or a likelihood? I would say we should take the more conservative approach in our budgeting numbers. Are you is, suggesting is a $1,400 decrease? I don't know. I, I have, I'm just saying if it's a possibility, you through your, your network of people uh, talking and just seeing is this. I think, um, I think I'm comfortable, Howard, personally, and, and with what Tina has done in terms of a best practice in terms of 700. I'm, I'm not interested in making up hypotheticals when oh. we have no idea what's coming down from Lansing. But, but, and, and Paul, that's, that's fine. You were one opinion out of seven. Uh, is it possible, Tina, maybe that um, Pat or you or someone can talk to uh, Senator Baer, Senator uh, Representative Mnuchin, and just see? Yeah. Howard, I have talked to Senator Baer and Senator Mnuchin. They have no idea what the number is going to be. Tina is probably closer to the number than they do in terms okay. of how it's going to trickle down to our district. I've had numerous conversations with 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 Senator Bear and Mari about that specific topic. 
I think Tina is closer to it than they are. I'm just saying right, right now. I, I'm just, I'm just, I, I, I will go with whatever Tina suggests for the final budget. I just want to, for the record, say that I am concerned that a across the board reduction um, might not be the worst. You know, $700 is a huge hit, big, much bigger than we had in 2012. I think that was $470 and that was very painful. But if, um, if the legislature gets involved and starts impacting the hold harmless districts more, um, we need to be prepared for that event or that possibility. I wouldn't say we put it in the budget, but I just say we should consider that as one of our scenarios going into the, uh, into the fall. All right, thanks, Howard. Um, Jennifer? Okay, thank you, Tina. Uh, we're, we're going, we're gonna shift gears to 101 land here. Um, you, you had given us after the meeting on May 15th, um, I forget the name of the meeting that you had with other financial persons. Um, you would, you, that's when this 700 number got incorporated. Then I thought I had heard that the state had walked that back and was considering not having a school aid cut for 2019, 2020. Is that mistaken information? But so based based on everything and many of my colleagues, especially in all corners of the state, were on a lister and the everyone continues to ask that clarifying question. And it is it is this year that the state has the shortfall. They have to do something. So it is this year that has that impact absent no other action. So everyone is just anxiously awaiting more actions, but it is this year's budget that has that shortfall and they cannot cover the expenditures that were planned this year. So it and is 1920. Can you, can you remind me what exact date the state budget, what's their end of year, beginning of year? Is that, is that early August? Mm -hmm. So the state year is October 1 through September 30th. Okay. Okay, so when and, we see mm -hmm. here, the state is talking about their expenses through September 30th. Yes, and it, it flows with the cash flow payments to schools where this year's majority of our revenue is foundation. And this year, the October through August payments, we get our payments beginning October through August, nothing in September. So in the last month of their year, there is no payout to school. So we still have a July and August state aid payment coming to us, even though our school year is done because it's following their fiscal year. Right, okay, and so, we mm -hmm. anticipate that's gonna be slashed um, because they have no new information about their funds, say from the federal government. Yes, federal government, we haven't heard anything on their own budget balancing efforts that may or may not help the school aid fund. And they also have a rainy day fund and are allowed to use up to 25% of it, but we don't know how they're going to use those money. Will some of that help the school aid fund? We do not know yet. Okay. All right, thank you. One one other question. In the beginning of your presentation, you had enrollment at, at 54 or something, um, which is, what what I understood our enrollment was. I know Paul has left our meeting, but his numbers were more at 5,300, 5,200. Are, are we anticipating a, a, a drop of say 100-ish students or, or is he just coming at this from a different set of numbers? He was, uh, he was presenting general ed numbers. And so my numbers include all of the FTEs that we are paid for, and you're right. So our, if I round without that decimal, it's 5555, five, five, five. easy to remember. That's the June status report has that. I doubt it'll change by August. And Paul is looking at general ed only, and mine includes special ed. Okay, that helps, thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions in the chat room. With that, I will go to um, Susan and, well, I think it's Sarah. i uh, gonna um, talk about the back to school task force update. All right, thank you all. Thank you.
Thanks, Paul. Yeah, Susan and I are going to be walking you through um, uh, a brief update about the return to school coalition. And Sarah, because we've elected her, we believe she has the best internet. We're going to go ahead and have her transition the slides. So, uh, Susan, is, um, you have a little bit. Of one, one second, Todd. I don't know if someone, if, um, cor if um, someone from technology can mute somebody. Uh, this is bad background. Oh, there you go. Susan, I think you were having a little bit of feedback when you when you were on. So if that continues, I'll try to pick up the slides that you were going to present on. Uh, so like I said, we have, um, there's a lot to contemplate as we move into next September and over the summer months, how we start to prepare for really what is the unknown. But we have some really good clues on what we should be preparing for, different type of models. And uh, we're gonna kind of walk you through a little bit of the organization, how we're trying to organize that thought process and uh, really create the conditions to be prepared for whatever we might be facing come September. So Sarah, if you could go to the next slide. Here I'm, uh, here we're displaying, here we're displaying really uh, four distinct areas that are a possibility for us. So first three, you'll see that they're offset from the online distance learning, and I'll explain that in just in a moment. And really those first three there, they line up with any type of risk levels that the government may be considering or CDC. And we have found this in a commonality amongst many plans that we've reviewed is really kind of setting up to prepare for face-to-face -face instruction, which is more in line with our traditional school year. However, it wouldn't necessarily look the same uh, in um, you know, anything short of a vaccine for September, uh, even traditional school isn't necessarily gonna look the same. So that face-to-face, -face, maybe kids are coming to school in person. However, there may be specific type of cleaning protocols or safety measures uh, to consider. So we need to go through all of those components. The second one there with that hybrid learning model, if we were into a mid range of risk area where we have to consider different type of parameters that the government puts in place that requires us to social distance to the point that we have to start taking a look at those hybrid models. And we'll come back to that in a moment as well. And then finally, the remote, remote learning. Um, and I want to stop here and just say that the remote learning that we'd be preparing for next fall, if we uh, end up in a situation where we're not allowed to open up school because of course our preference is to have in-person school. And uh, however, short of that, it would not be under the plan that we have right now. The plan that we have right now, the continuous learning model 2.0, it was a good plan to sustain ourselves for the rest of this year, but it certainly wouldn't suffice to move into that next year as well. So that would be a new version of the continuous learning model. And so that really kind of describes the three scenarios in which we need to prepare for. You heard Paul Wills talk a little bit about uh, the potential need for a virtual academy type experience. We're predicting that, um, again, short of a vaccine, that we'll have some families, no matter what safety protocols we have, even if we're in a hybrid model or if things look very different, it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll be ready to return their children to school to us. And we wanna make sure that we're ready for students in that scenario. Or the opposite could be true. It could be that, if we're required to wear um, uh, masks or if the safety measures become too much uh, in what we're required to do, we could have families elect not to participate in that type of school environment. And again, so we would want to have a virtual program set up where we would be able to um, uh, make sure that we're still providing services for our students in that manner. So, so you can almost think of that online distance learning format as something that would be in place regardless of the other three. And the other three, you can almost think of those as dials that you might have choices in terms of turning based on the risk factors that we could be facing by September. So if Susan, if your, if your audio works, let's test it out one more time. If not, I'll take the, the next slide too. And Sarah, if you can move that forward. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, um, so what Todd just showed you was the graphic that um, in your packet, you have this fuller continuum um, and so what he was really describing were um, really the differences across that continuum with really the fourth one being one that would launch no matter what the factors. And if you move down that chart, you see um, some of the things that no matter what we go into are things that we probably have to attend to. So by really doing that thinking exercise, we started to see um, some of the things that are just really good things to put our energy into thinking about right now. 
um, as we get ready for September. And I think we can move on to the next slide. So we've organized all this work into five different task force. So remember, we have to consider everything, maybe how, um, uh, how we're going to transport students, uh, how students are going to stand in a line, uh, perhaps how students move in and out of the office, or what are we going to do if, if a child has a fever, what are safety measures that we'll have in place for staff, um, to different type of programming concerns that we might have. We've been working with uh, the music department to start rethinking how we might flip the classroom so that kids aren't necessarily singing in the same space, but they might do that at home and videotape themselves and bring that into the classroom. So all of those things need to be deconstructed and put back together with this new environment that we're going to be running into. So we've divided up that into five categories. The first one really being around a study for blended learning models. And uh, I know um, uh, it's Jennifer that's on that category. We have a few board members that are mixed in these different uh, task forces. And that's taking a look at those different models in terms of what might be our strategy if we have to move into a blended model or hybrid model. That particular task force is also going to take a look at the continuous learning plan 2.0 and look for opportunities to increase the rigor and the sophistication along with the uh, assessment practices and how we might be able to put those frameworks into place so that if we do have to launch into that um, uh, remote learning style that we would have that repaired or almost thinking of it as being in one area and then having to move to another area because maybe there's a resurgence of COVID in the area um, or, or that the government um, or that the governor's office uh, makes moves to, to shut us down again or that type of situation. The second task force there is looking at a virtual academy for Bloomfield Hills. We're likely not gonna call it an academy. It's gonna be a virtual programming, but you can think of it as of right now, you can think of it as an academy. And this we're looking at launching, no matter if we end up in a distance uh, learning style, if we end up in a hybrid or a face-to-face -face, um, learning scenario, we're looking at making sure that we have this preserved and that we have a way to enroll students in this type of category. So we don't lose them because they're not ready to, or maybe they have uh, a family member that is medically fragile and they're not willing to take that risk. We want to make sure that they have a place within our district and we don't lose them. The third one, the flexible schedule task force. This is made up of our most expert schedulers in the dis district. Uh, we have union leadership sitting in this um, task force. We have learning services in there, uh, HR. And because no matter what model we pick, then the mechanics have to come in and actually pull off the scheduling for that. There's a lot to consider as you try to maneuver 5,200 kids through various schedules. Uh, when you have to consider transportation and everything else, like all of those things have to come together. So that task force is looking at all those nuances to be able to make sure that we're designing flexible models that we would be able to adapt and be nimble in. The next one, number four, is uh, really around the health and well-being. And uh, what we're looking at is largely around um, social emotional learning, as well as trauma-informed work to make sure that we have that embedded in our approach throughout next year, um, no matter what model that we're looking at. And then finally is uh, the last task force there with taking inventory. And this is largely around operations, uh, maintenance, as well as um, uh, our, our physical infrastructure to take a look at how many classroom spaces can we utilize, uh, what are different types of scenarios if we can only have 15 kids on a bus or 20 kids on a bus, uh, how many classrooms are we going to be short if we're only allowed to put 15 kids in a classroom or 20 kids into a classroom? So we have to take all of those things into consideration and they're taking inventory for us so that we can make quick decisions around those pieces. Chair, want to jump to the next slide? So to organize this work, uh, Pat formed a steering committee. And in fact, we'll be meeting tomorrow morning with updates from each one of the task forces to consider the different type of components that we're looking at. We'll be trying to observe for uh, overlaps in the work to see if we can't con continue to consolidate the focus areas. Uh, it's important to be able to vet off ideas that we feel are not practical and we don't need to spend our time anymore. We spend enough time researching it, but we feel that we're not going, that it's not a useful tool for us. 
Uh, so we have that task force uh, uh, built by Pat, and it's really helped making sure that all the um, task forces have clear direction from that steering committee, allows us to come together and uh, really kind of share that insight as we move forward. Yeah, yep, thank you. And, uh, you know, to kind of look at all these different scenarios, there are several places that we've been studying, um, you know, between uh, especially Pat as well as learning services. Um, I don't even think I could take a guess of how many different plans that we have dissected and researched and been able to synthesize to be able to find patterns. Um, Susan, I know you were gonna talk about this a little bit. Susan, what's your guess on how many different plans we've, we've dissected at this point collectively? Well, I mean, that's not even everything that's on that slide. And even today, I added a few more things to our resource um, folder. Um, even when we are seeing like, for instance, Troy's plan and communication that's coming out, we, we insert that in. Um, but what you see even in that slide, we go from state departments of ed who are coming forward and giving um, to their districts uh, feedback in terms of like, here are all the potential scenarios. Um, but again, those documents are trying to plan for a whole entire state. And so they have to give them just all the options. And then we found uh, the Japan document that is a district document, but the, the resounding pattern, whether it's by district or if it's by state, is that you have to plan for multiple possible scenarios. Uh, that's what everybody is um, doing, whether it's in a district where they're saying, we know that we're gonna be in some type of learning model that is face-to-face, -face, hybrid or remote. Um, and here in Bloomfield, we're saying, and we are also attending to students who say just no matter what from the start of the year that they need to stay in distance learning. So that is one thing that Bloomfield has um, really put in their plan that I'm not seeing yet in the other plans. Um, so there is a, a wealth of information and every day more and more is coming in. Um, and the common pattern is is nobody knows. Nobody knows exactly what the factors are going to be in September, but what they do know is we have to be ready to pivot and be nimble and move between lots of different scenarios that might happen across a school year. Thank you, and, and to help us to make that decision, uh, we really appreciated this model, and you heard Susan mention, uh, out of all of these different types of models, the one that we really feel is, is an exemplar right now is the model coming out of the American school in Japan. And uh, in particular in there, there is, there is a, a guidance document that helps you make the decision or the barometer that you might consider of whether or not you're opening in these different phases. So we put this table in here. We think there's really good language. Uh, we think one of the next steps and uh, possibly even at the board level is to consider the different type of categories or, or language that would situate in these different categories that would help us make a decision of when to move in and out of these different type of, type of models. And so it could be that the language right here you find favorable and that, that we adopt uh, a good portion of it or we may adapt that differently. And so on our last slide here, this is what that would look like um, as we move that there, we could go to the next, yep, there you go. And so as we look at that as developing our own bench benchmark in terms of how we might make that decision in terms of those three categories where, um, you know, when are we in distance learning? When are we in hybrid learning models? And when are we in face-to-face -face instruction? More than likely, uh, I can't see any scenario in which we continue in distance learning model without the governor dictating that we would be in that model. So I think we are planning to open up unless we are unable to open up. Yet at the same time, what you heard Susan mention is we want to make sure that for those students who are planning to or maybe not ready to come back to school, that we're going to continue a uh, virtual academy setting type experience so that we'll be able to uh, attend to their needs no matter what category that we fall into um, throughout the year. And it could be that maybe we move through uh, two or more of those categories. So hopefully uh, um, that was um, kind of a quick rundown to give you an idea of the scope of the task force, the type of um, complexities that we're trying to maneuver through and plan for. Uh, we think we have some good models, but a lot can change between now and September. 
Uh, so we're really trying to study all of those pieces and, and be very thoughtful in that, uh, in that experience. I know we have Jackie on the steering committee, Jennifer is in task force one. Um, I believe task force two is, or maybe Howard's on task force four, and then Cynthia's on task force two uh, with the virtual uh, learning academy. So that's it, uh, um, I'll check to see if there's any questions. Hold on, let me click on the chat here. Or Paul, maybe you wanna guide yeah, the questions towards us. No, yeah, no question in the chat, but I do have one question. This has come up from our community. Can you can you let us know, Todd, what's been the process to involve our community in some of these task forces in terms of the decisions and 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 who you know who high level is on there representing um, our community? Yeah, I don't have names in front of me, but I do know that uh, each one of the task force has uh, staff, parents, and students that are either already involved or plans to bring them into the process. So some task forces are already far enough ahead to be able to uh, embed them into the work. And I know other areas within those task force still need another week to prepare. And then we'll be sending out those invites to kind of land them into the middle of the work um, in the next week or two. I, I guess the question more so is in terms of deciding on which parents and or students were on these task force outside of the board, um, what, what, what was the process to determine, you know, who would be on what task force and, and how was that decided? I'd have to defer to Pat on that. Um, I know that he has some names specifically, but uh, learning services didn't, didn't develop a specific uh, process for that. So uh, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit more in terms of what his vision is for that, but I do know that he has some names um, and we've been able to embed those individuals in the work. I think most significantly, um, Pat had three good recommendations for uh, medical professionals that I believe ended up on task force five. Uh, to really kind of help us consider um, uh, some of those safety features. Right, and I can talk to that a little bit. You know, we're working under a short time frame, so the goal is to either a get people that are medical professionals, whether they're neuropsychologists, they're MD or PhD MD, and to make sure we have representations of parents who are that are both working at home, um, a stay-at-home parent. Uh, members from the PAC to make sure that our special education students are represented, making sure we have staff members that are special ed teachers in DHH. So we try to kind of cast a quick, you know, web to try to capture those parents that will fall into those categories. Uh, because the the time frame, there is no way of trying to put all call out to the community and do interviews and have a full thorough process. Um, that's something we'll be doing when we start the superintendent steering committee. When that starts to roll out, that will be more of a long process when it comes to making sure that we have um, those groups represented in a more articulated way. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Pat. All right. I don't see anything else in the chat room, so I'm going to move on. Thanks yeah. a lot, Todd. Okay. Jennifer? We have, we have questions here. Okay. Myself, then Lisa, then Mark. Um, oh, is that in the, oh, I sorry, I didn't see that. I didn't go down. Okay, I got it. And okay. president. Uh, no, uh. So, um, Todd, I have a, a technical question here. Going back to the one of the first slides you showed that had four columns, face-to-face, -face, hybrid, remote, and online, um, I don't really understand the difference between remote and online because presumably remote means all remote, otherwise it's hybrid and online is also all online. So like when we talk about families who choose to stay home because they're at risk, I, I, I'm just not understanding why there's two categories there. Todd, I can answer that if you like. Or I can answer it. <laughs> okay, so I'll jump right, in. I'll go. Okay. Go ahead, Susan, sorry. So I think what's confusing there is that the, when you have those three circles that are connected, those are the things that are interlocked um, based on the kind of contextual things that might happen. So remote learning could happen for a span of two weeks if we have some amount of shutdown. So that's why you see it connected to those three is that remote learning there is if it does come down to a shutdown, we've seen things in the literature that are saying there might be a 14 to 28 day, let's say, span of time that we go into remote learning, and then they would open back up. 
where online distance learning is saying from the get-go, this student or these students are saying, I am opting to be completely in online distance learning from the start of the year um, till at least through the first semester, and no matter if there are face-to-face -face classrooms. Uh, okay, but wouldn't wouldn't they be identically mirrored curricula though? Because say say we shut down October 1st for two weeks, aren't you just moving to the online distance track and just picking up there? I just don't know if they're qualitatively two different things. Right, so I think that you'll probably find that there'll be a little bit of difference because what we're hoping for, and if we have remote learning this time, is that we have some face-to-face -face time to get students into um, resources that might have digital expansion resources where on the online distance learning, those students aren't going to have um, any face-to-face on-site time to maybe have those additional resources. And so it's also a big, big task to make online curriculum in a very short span of time that's of high quality. So we're really looking for what would be some core foundational curriculum that is built specifically for an online scenario um, and how can we enhance it and make it a Bloomfield Hills branded experience. So, so does that mean, Susan, that we would start with something that was purchased? That's something that, you know, that um, is part of the task force two is investigating. I don't want to say there's a decision, but that's what we're investigating is what is there even out there? Um, and then what is the criteria through which we want to, uh, to evaluate how well a fit or not a fit it might be? So did I, I'm sorry, last one, I promise. Did I hear you correctly that you said that anyone who opts for the online distance learning for at least one semester, they're not going to have any synchronous experiences with our teachers? No, no, not at all. Um, that's where we're saying we, we want to make it a Bloomfield Hills experience. And so connectivity and community are guiding principles of no matter what learning model we go with. Um, and so there would be synchronous um, connection points for sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks Jennifer. Lisa? Um, okay. <laughs> My question is a lot like Jennifer's. There seems like a lot of task forces and to me who has no experience with, um, you know, I'm not on BIC and I've never seen this presentation uh, in this depth before, but I, I can't keep track of them. I, I know it's tough. Um, you know, I heard Todd, you know, kind of confused as to who's on which one. I, I don't know that they're distinct, all of them. I don't know as much as Jennifer even to point out where there seems like a lot of overlap, but there does. And I really don't know how um, setting up groups of people that seem autonomous, except for the umbrella of whatever that big task, the, you know, the organizing task force, the steering committee, uh, what if there's a great idea in the health and well-being that's applicable to virtual or hybrid and everyone could benefit from the idea? Um, and, and I know time is of the essence. Is it not more efficient um, and does it not promote more idea sharing to just get everybody in one room and make it, you know, like a big task force? So I can talk to some of that. So. When you look at the steering committee, I know you don't get to see the members, but we're all represented in what, you know the different task force groups. And understand, we're trying to reinvent school in 24 days. And that's really what we're trying to do. So we spent our time researching. We spent our time making sure we finished up continuous learning plan 2.0. And so the goal is not to have a finished product at the next board meeting. The goal is to have a draft that we can share. Here's what we've learned. Here's where we feel our best two or three you know, hybrid options as far as going forward and then sharing that out for the community and then getting feedback because it's very important that the community has the opportunity to weigh in because we we don't know what we don't know. The community members might say, 
Well, you listed that as a third option, but as a community, 75% of us feel that is the best thing to do. And to try to get everyone in one room and just try to go over these different items, we just simply don't have the time. And so we try to put the people that were most skilled. So we try to get the right people on the bus and get the right people in the right seats to drive these committees. And then like when we meet tomorrow with the steering committee, first thing on our agenda, other than a check-in, is for each task force co-chair to share out what's going on. So we'll still be able to get that information. So if it's a matter of, you know, Howard's in the health and well-being, he, you know, task force, there is a steering committee member that's on there and might say, hey, we came up with this idea. We feel it's important for everyone else. And then when we get the feedback from the board at the next board meeting and we get the feedback from the community, then we can finalize our plan with the expectation that the state of Michigan, based on a conversation I have with someone today, um, there's an expectation that very short term, next couple of weeks, that we'll have some type of guidance um, out from MDE in the state of Michigan, and that will help finalize the plan. And okay. I know Jennifer, so, oh, sorry. Sorry. sorry, if I'm watching this and I have no idea what's happening in the fall, I'm leaving this meeting with no idea of what's happening in the fall. Uh, so if I can't follow all this and, and we wanna sort of summarize the gist of it for people, what I'm taking away from our discussion is that we are opening schools to the maximum extent possible allowed by our governor whenever that announcement's made. However, we will have options that vary in degrees of openness depending on what parents are comfortable with for their own children. So if you don't feel comfortable until there's a vaccine or for whatever reason you have an immunocompromised person that you're close to or caring for, uh, you can opt for less physical interaction, but we will have an option that maximizes the amount of face-to-face -face learning allowed by our governor. Yes, yeah, so yeah. let me summarize for everyone watching because I want to make sure everyone's on the same page. And you're right. You know, it's easy for us to sit in the task force and discuss this hours upon hours and come out and talk and understand. But for someone sitting at home, they probably are confused. So our expectation is we are going to have face-to-face -face instruction next year. We don't know what that's going to look like, but that is our expectation. So what are we planning for? We're planning for students to be back in the building and whatever that new normal is going to be. We also know based on, for example, the state of Illinois has opened up their schools for summer school, but they have social distancing. So that's where the hybrid model comes in. So we know we might have to have a hybrid model where kids have to be six feet apart. And what does that look like? We're betting those. Another thing we're preparing for is we know there's the possibility that in the middle of December, the governor could say, we're shutting schools for 14 days because of the rise of COVID-19. And then we need to be able to pivot and go back to continuous learning plan, not 2.0, summer was 3.0, but a 4.0 plan. And so those updates we heard from parents, what are some of the main things we all saw in the surveys? I want more face-to-face, -face, right? More synchronous. I want more meaningful work where they're actually creating things. I want the opportunity for my students to collaborate with other students respectfully on some type of assignment and work together. And I want a, a real schedule, um, not a sample schedule, not a schedule that's maybe, maybe not, but one. Um, so that is just like going to school. And the last thing the parents really want is they wanted to count. They wanted to be mandatory. We know we had MDE guidance that said, you know, you have to hold kids harmless, but the parents really want it to be mandatory. So they can say, the school says it's mandatory, you're going to get a grade. And the last thing we're preparing for, and I've heard from lots of parents who have said, Pat, I don't think I'm going to bring my child back in the fall. Um, even if there's a vaccine, I'm not sure it's going to be safe because it's been rushed. What possibilities do you have for me? And that's where the online academy comes in so that you can stay home that semester, or maybe you stay home for a year, but you're still a Bloomfield Hills student. You still get a Bloomfield Hills school district teacher. You're still part of the community. And then after that half year or that year, you can make that decision whether or not you want to stay. For some, they may like it so much, they continue to stay. And that's how they finish their career. We're trying to make sure we can have something for every single parent. I All think right. The so we're, in the, we're in this task force uh, roadmap. Is... Uh, 
where do where's survey feedback analyzed? How do I know all the things that you just said make a lot of sense, but which task force does all of that? How do we make sure that they all know that parents overwhelmingly and students overwhelmingly want synchronous virtual learning? How do they know uh, that we've gotten great feedback about outdoor classrooms and different kinds of ways to in-person learn? I, I can't match that with one of these octagons or so, sorry, hexagons. So Lisa, I that's octagons. that's sort of what I've been doing in, in number one, blended learning. I've been giving them all the information from the surveys um, and hopefully there are similar sources in, in the other committees yeah, don't um, all the committees need that though, Jennifer? All that survey data needs to go to all the committee, all the task well, forces. Well, Pat, right? to the extent that Pat knows it, um, I think that would happen. Um, I, and it wouldn't go to all task force. You know, the operations yeah. and planning. You know, we're talking about buses and face masks. They don't really need to know what the survey says. Remember, this is a high level view. What we're saying is, this is our work. This is the work we're in right now. The work is not complete. At the next board meeting, we'll get a better idea because we'll have our draft at that point, right? We can talk about six or def, six or seven different blended learning models. We're not going to bring forward, you know, six or seven. We've already, you know, Jennifer's part of the conversation. We've already kicked some of them out because we feel there will be no support of the community. Then once we bring that forward and then the survey goes out to the community, here's our draft of a plan. What do you like? What don't you like? And then we come back and we continue the work to finalize it and bring it to the board at another time. So you're just really getting the overview, but you brought up the great point, which is we need to make sure parents understand that there's going to be something for them, that our goals will be back in school, whatever that new normal is. If we have to go to social distancing, we'll have two or three different models of hybrids that are possible that they'll get a chance to share their opinion on, give comments and rank order that if we close in the middle of December, what do I want to know as a parent? I want to know it's not going to take three weeks to have something online. I want to know you're going to be prepared because everyone knows it's a possibility. So are you going to be prepared? So we're preparing for that. And the last thing, I, like I said, we have parents that as of right now, and it could change, but they may want to stay home. So we have to have a fully virtual academy for those parents as well. And that's the expectation of the community, that we take our time, that we're not first, that we get it right, that we do our research. You know, we brought forth two models. I guarantee you there's no one else in the state of Michigan that's looking at the Japanese international school and brought forth that model because we've searched far and wide to anyone we can reach out to to make sure we've turned over every single stone to make sure we try to provide the best potential opportunities for all our students. All right, and that makes sense, Pat, and thank you for that explanation. I, I can't get from your verbal explanation to how that's represented in all these diagrams, I, I, but that might just be me. So, you know, uh, I'll assume that this makes more sense to other people, but this stuff on paper in my mind uh, isn't obviously, um, you know, it doesn't obviously come get to the point of what you just said, but thank you I for that, that, that's more clear hearing you say it. Um, I, and, and just, you know, like Paul already said, that we've gotten some really good feedback. So I, I understand, um, not having time to interview and leaving, needing to uh, like uh, pivot and you know all that stuff quickly. But we have great emails and great survey comments from students and parents that would be excellent on one of these task forces. And sorry, I don't know which one, but I'm sure that you could fit them in somewhere without having to go through a lengthy interview process. Uh, maybe they should just be called and offered some, I mean, um, uh, that's where I pulled the majority of names oh, from. Good. Excellent. So those that have been communicating, you know, I don't want to mention people's name out of respect for them, but these are people that have been emailing me, talking to me, sharing feedback continuously. So I plucked some of them right away. But we also want to make sure we open up to everyone in the community, right? Yeah. Everyone has that opportunity. So as Kelly and I work on, you know, the superintendent steering committee that we're going to roll out, that will be open to all stakeholders. And we'll have a process in place to make sure everyone has the opportunity to be part of that. And you're right. What I give the explanation of, you're not going to see in the presentation. The presentation is exactly what I asked everyone to do. Just give something really high level so that the community knows because we've been focused on teaching and learning in the moment. They haven't heard a lot from us in the central office about 
what is the fall going to look like? Do you guys even have a plan? Are you even thinking about it? Like, where are your minds right now? And so this is that high level, like we're thinking about it. We know we need to have a plan. We're organizing, we're studying, we're putting the pieces in place. Two weeks from now, we'll have some more pieces in place. You weigh in as a community and then we continue to go from there. Well, maybe if we could summarize it in like three sentences for the community, uh, you know, who, who really isn't going uh, to, I mean, I'll summarize. To, just, I can't understand this. So, you know, there's got to be people out there that can't really. No problem. Our so, goal, our plan is to have everyone back in the building for face-to-face -face instruction. We're not sure what that's going to look like yet, but that is our expectation. If we have to have social distancing, we will have a plan for that. If we have to have a hybrid model, meaning some kids come one day, another day, we'll have a plan for that. We'll have actually multiple plans for that so the community can weigh in and what model they feel is best. Okay. Or we'll have a plan that says, if we're going to shut down school and we're going to go to remote learning, you know, a continuous learning plan, but improved, they'll know that plan before school starts. So if we do shut down, you know, Ms. Afros, you would know that, okay, well, school shots, I know exactly what the plan is going to be. Here's the schedule. Here's what my kid's going to be doing. I already know. I don't even have to guess. <clears throat> I don't even need to wait for school to be shut down. There's already a plan in place. The teachers know it. We have agreement with the teachers and the teachers union. We're done. And then, you know, if Cynthia says, well, my daughter's staying home. That's great. I, I'd rather have her stay home next year as a fourth grader. What do you have for me? Then we have something for them, too. All right, just just before I before Je, uh, Jennifer and Jackie may have a comment as well. I know Mark put his uh, Mark has uh, a question as well. He's in the chat room. Mark. Yeah, thank you, um, Pat, Todd, Susan, and the rest of the team. Um, tremendously appreciative of all of your efforts that uh, have gone into this, and frankly, I'm very impressed by all of the efforts that have gone into this. Uh, I appreciate that you guys have looked far and wide. Uh, that you have haven't precipitously jumped to any conclusions. And uh, you're, you know, I think you're really taking the best approach possible under these circumstances. There's no perfect solution, uh, but uh, I'm confident that you guys are going to come up with one that is very well reasoned and uh, that would be what's best for our students. So here's my question. In terms of the starting point for the fall, Todd, on the second to last page of your uh, presentation there, there was a link uh, to several different places. And one of the links was to Oakland County's uh, Health Division. So I clicked on that and I read it. And the second line or second paragraph, and this comes from Leanne Stafford, health officer. It says on the second paragraph, school will reopen in the fall for students to attend in person. And when it says school will, the word will is completely capitalized. So where it's, is, that, is that a conclusion? Is that a mandate? Is that, what is that from Oakland County? Because um, first I looked at it as maybe a recommendation, but with the word will, um, it, it looked like uh, a directive. I can talk Actually, about that, Mark. Oh, sorry, sorry. Mark. sorry. That's right. I would just I just pulled it up, Mark. I don't know if it's on the screen or not, depending on how I'm presenting, but it's saying only if we're in phase five or phase six, school will reopen. So it all depends on what phase we are in terms of the, the one to six phase of the governor's plan. So, so if, if I read it slightly differently, um because I didn't see the if in there. I read it as we are in at least phase phase five as of June second, because that's the date on this. And then um, so I didn't see it as an if in there, and I could be reading it wrong, and I appreciate the clarification, but um, and I don't know if anybody's reached out to Oakland County on this to see how or why, or if you guys think we, there's more clarification needed, but I'll leave it to you guys, um, but that was just my question and what I was curious about. Thanks, sorry, Mark. I I, oh, sorry. I just pulled the tab up. I don't know if you can see it or not. Yeah. yeah, we can. Um, okay. So I, it doesn't say if, but it does say in accordance. So basically we're in five phase five or phase six, phase six is when schools would open. So I, there probably should have been an if, but there's not. Okay. 
Yeah, but I have to say, this is the same thing that colleges are doing, and it's all over the Chronicle of Higher Education. They are saying we will open, but then it's saying as long as the state lets us, you know, they're doing exactly the same thing. Yeah, it was just funny, you know, coming from the county um, that it, it looked uh, like there was somebody was finally, you know, giving guidance uh, from upstream. <laughs> Wishful thinking. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you, Mark. Everybody. Cynthia? Um, Pat, I have a question for you regarding guidelines. So um, I was looking at the Massachusetts state plan uh, that was recently released, and it looks to me, to me like their plan is a mandate that allows no more than 10 students in a classroom. Uh, it doesn't look like guidelines. Do we have any idea if what whatever we would get from the governor's office or from the MDE will be given to us in the terms of, of mandate or as guideline? So thank you for sending that document to me today. Um, I did get a chance to read it and write. In the state of Massachusetts, it is mandated no more than 10 students per class and up to two adults, one teacher and one para. So your guess is as good as mine is what the mandate may or may not be, or is it going to be, these are guiding principles, but as a local educational authority, you can do what you want with them, or are they just going to cut and paste the CDC guidelines? So we don't know. Um, what, so we're operating based on what do we do now? We know there's going to be some guidelines regarding cleaning. So let's look at best practices around that. We know that the possibility, there's a possibility of school going in and out. So let's work around that. We know we need to have a hybrid model, so let's work around that. We know there are going to be students who don't return and want to fully online, so let's work around that. So we're working within the framework of what we know are definite possibilities. And then when the guidelines or suggestions or mandates come out from MDE and the governor, then at that point we'll pivot, we'll include it, and we'll make that as part of our plan as well. So time is of the essence. And so I'm very much looking forward to getting that documentation from the state as soon as possible, uh, especially since we've looked at, you know, examples from just about everywhere. I know I sent to Shira today a one sheeter from the state of Hawaii that really sums up their plan really nice is easy for parents to see as an exemplar when we have our stuff done, how we can create a one sheeter that parents can have and hang on their fridge or take home or print out so they know what's going on as well. And Shira, if if it comes in the form of a mandate from the state, um, does it apply equally to private schools? I believe so, but I'm not sure. If it comes from the health sure. department, it applies to all schools. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Yep. Cynthia, you have any sure, other questions? So, um, Jennifer, you have a comment? Yeah, I just I just wanted to speak um, to Lisa's form point about I mean this is you could just your head could pop off right because there's there's an endless amount of work with an endless amount of variables I, for me and I think and, and I've shared this with Task Force Number One it, it's helpful to have guiding principles of keep it simple stupid and and really how in any of these scenarios how can we best mimic a school day, a real school day, um, because the teachers, the students, the parents are are pretty much agreed on this point. You know, nothing takes the place of, of the face to face relationship. So, I, I agree that it's. But I, what I like about our plan is there's definitely going to be crosstalk. Okay, like like say the hybrid team makes three, puts forward three hybrids. Medical team says, uh uh, number two's out. Right. Um, and, and so there will be interaction and there's a lot of voices. We have a lot of the special ed staff um, in, in my group and it's gonna be really, really helpful. So I think I think it's daunting, but I, I, I am very confident that the work will get done and, and that the community um, will feel embraced. And, and I'm really grateful to you, Pat, for incorporating a community feedback into what whatever hybrids um come down the pike 
All right, with that, there's nothing else in the chat room. Um, again, I thank was going to say something. Oh, okay. um, Sorry, Jack. There, we've been talking about the macro, but there's also the micro. If a student, for example, gets COVID and they are face to face, that means that not only are, you know, not only would they have the macro where the parents are choosing, but there also could be the case that if a student get it, then all the other students are exposed, and then they would have to go and uh, isolate and be remote and then come back in. It's like, there's so many possibilities. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, if there's no other comments or questions, um, thank you team for presenting and all the work you're doing on the, for the various task force. We're gonna move on to middle school world languages. Todd, Sarah, uh, Mary. Thanks, Sarah. Can everybody hear me okay? I think I lost audio for a little bit. Okay, yeah, great. we're fine. Okay, great. We're uh, going to be discussing world languages this evening. And of course, this conversation goes back uh, over a year. And um, what we've been tasked to do is really take a look at how we can increase the proficiencies in world language. And you probably remember some study sessions around that. We came to some decision points. And then a parallel conversation with that was also a bond initiative. And ultimately where we ended up was that we felt as though we would likely be having uh, a bond initiative on the March or May ballot. And that what we would really be doing is post that bond election, we would be creating a transition plan into a new two middle school model. And that's how we would package in world languages around that scenario. Of course, nobody was expecting COVID to happen and delay our bond to the summer. So now we are kind of flip-flopping um, some, some the timeliness of, of, um, of how we might program forward for this. So one of the things that we're looking at is, um, is our numbers and trying to make decisions what would be best in uh, what we're presuming to end up being a two middle school model based on a successful bond election in August. And, um, and as we kind of plan forward, Sarah, I'm wondering, I think that's a live link right there. If you could click on the numbers for us, what they look like. Thank you. And Sarah, if you could move over just a little bit so we can look at uh, the percentage of high school students in each category. There you see Chinese, oh, we went a little fast, sorry. Chinese, we have about, uh, out of all the students in rural languages, uh, Chinese has about 7.5% of our students in them. For French, we have 10.7% of our students. And there we can see the numbers in German at the high school. Uh, it ranges at around just under 6%. And then of course, Spanish is at 76%. And then above those are the percentages of all sixth, seventh and eighth graders in Spanish. And that number typically holds true for us. So as we kind of, um, even if we had two middle schools or one middle school or three middle schools, uh, we would likely have about 70% of the student population sign up for Spanish. And then the other 30% generally kind of split themselves into whatever else is available. And so what we're taking a look at is how do we look uh, to support students in terms of really maintaining that proficiency and not having a drop off between eighth and ninth grade. So as we consider all of those different scenarios at BIC, we came up with a scenario. And if you could go back to the uh, slideshow, the presentation and on that next slide there, Sarah. What we were doing, trying to do is uh, look at the sustainability of these world languages and really what we thought would be realistic for a uh, two middle school model and as well as uh, what we're realizing at the high school as those numbers filter in. And we feel right now it's best place to take German and move that into our online category. One of the things that we didn't do when we are looking at those student numbers is show you the range of different type of world languages that we offer in an online format. So as uh, BIC and with continued conversation with um, uh, building uh, admin, uh, we've been able to formulate what we believe to be a proposed change starting for the next school year in which we would replace German at BHMS and move German to an online format and continue to support that through that mechanism. Um, but that this would probably be more in line with the type of numbers that we're seeing so that we can move students into a world language where we're seeing a much less drop off between that eighth and ninth grade year and be able to support them uh, in that manner. As we look at two, a two middle school model, 
We feel very confident that a two middle school model would be able to support two world languages and likely be able to support three world languages. But once we get to four world languages, we believe we would see the dwindling numbers like we see at the high school right now in comparison, where it would really start to stretch, it would really start to stretch out those other three world languages that would be in-person sessions to see those same type of numbers where you're seeing, you know, uh, four students in a class or 14 students in a class. But we feel very confident that two sustained very well because you could almost imagine it being split between 70 and 30. But remember that 30% that isn't in Spanish, it really just keeps getting divided up between the other world languages. So every time you add on another world language in person, it starts to peel off that 30%. So this is a, a model that we're looking for feedback and direction for um, in terms of being able to move forward. So um, I, I have a couple of questions and comments, and I don't see anything else in the chat room yet. So, so what what are we going to? Uh, you know, I'm confused. Spanish obviously is one of them. We are, are we suggesting the other language is French in in the three middle schools, and then we when we eventually go to a two middle school model, is it just French and Spanish? And then what what have we done outside of looking at those high school numbers in terms of surveying our community, in terms of their feedback um, as to you know, what they would prefer, what have we done there? That is an option that, that we've discussed where we could just simply send out in terms of uh, um, letting kids register for classes and letting, you know, whichever kids land in, that, that's how we would try to staff for. But largely what we do in considering that survey is, is look at the trends of how students register themselves. So with really kind of putting student choice at the center of this and, try, and really trying to track what their preferences are based on what they enroll into, um, that's what's informing this. It was my, my understanding in speaking with some of the family ambassadors is that German was a real, um, it, it, having German in one of, in, in one of our schools um, you know, helped us in terms of uh, attracting some of our students and families who came here, you know, as whether it was expatriates or transferred here for a couple of years with the idea they'd be going back to their high school and they had their 10th grade proficiency exam. So at a middle school level, it was a definitely an advantage for students coming here as opposed to other districts. I don't know how much research was, you know, was done that, and that may be the reason why our numbers at the high school are down because they're here for a couple of years and they go back and they enroll and then leave. But again, I, I'd be curious, you know, in terms of what our families would say in terms of a survey. But I'll leave that as a comment. Howard, you had a question. Uh, thank you, uh, President Coleman. Uh, I'm wondering, Todd, wh why is it that German has such a big drop off between middle school and high school? It's likely based on the difficulty of an English speaking person learning those different languages. So you can look at, um, uh, there, each one are categorized based on the difficulty of it. And Spanish tends to be one of the easier languages for an English, for English speaking person to uh, learn as well as French kind of being in that category as well. And German tends to be a little bit more difficult. So the retention rate, as we look at proficiency, that may be having an impact of that over time. And Sarah, but, I don't know if you wanted to uh, but, comment. Uh, Todd, wouldn't Chinese have the, the greatest level of difficulty because it's different uh, character set? I mean, at least German is part of uh, a lot of English is in the Germanic, is from the Germanic language. No, you're absolutely right. Chinese is a very difficult language to learn much more than the others that are listed right there. And uh, the, the um, however we feel that that students really understand that. They really understand that this is a real difficult language to learn. And so the student making that choice is really kind of signing up for that level of rigor and uh, what's gonna be expected within that language. I think it's also important to recognize that students are selecting a language at the middle school when they are 10 or 11 or 12 years old. And sometimes they're selecting away from a language versus into a language. Um, is another important thing. If you can only speak between G uh, German and Spanish and you don't like Spanish, you're gonna pick German. So, I mean, it, part of it is the ages that they're actually selecting this is a sixth grade level. 
Jennifer, thanks, Sarah. Jennifer, you had a comment? Yeah, and um, Pat, please take over because I'm I'm just about to mimic what you said at BIC the other day. So so there's a couple practical exigencies here. Um, one of which is German teacher resigned. Very hard to find a good German teacher. Even if we could find a teacher and they were good, we would only be employing them part time. And so the, the feasibility of finding somebody who fits that bill is, is challenging. Um, it was also expressed in BIC that many of our people coming here to live and work long term temporary, it's German is actually may not even be a primary language, um, Italian. Portuguese, um, you know, it, it's kind of a, a heterogeneous mix. Um, I, I do agree a survey would have been very nice, um, but I don't think at the end of the day it would it would be able to inform the the decision that we're up against from from a staffing point of view. But I'm going to be quiet now because these all of these points I just said um, were shared by Pat with, at BIC. There was another point that Sarah made about the German students having to go to set, to weekend school, Sarah. Yeah, so for students to return, German students to return to Germany for college, they have to have certification from a German school. And the only one in the area that offers that certification is um, out of Ann Arbor. I wish I could remember the name off the top of my head. So it's called German Saturday School. And so even if a student were to get um, German 500 level AP, that's not enough to go back to the German university. They have to be certified by this German school and that certification happens in 10th grade. So they, their exposure to us is one thing, but they, you can't take the test of that school unless you attend classes at that school. So part of what you're seeing is a peel off from students here to go take German at the German school that they have to take on the weekends anyway, number one. Number two is the only thing they're looking for them to have is another language that's either French or Italian um, as a, a second language in addition to English. So that's why those students will take French here. So I don't know, I wasn't here when the decision was made to add German. Um, at the time, I don't know when that school opened in the Ann Arbor area, but uh, since it's open, that is where the German students who are wanting to return to Germany, um, that is where they are um, getting that certification from. Okay, I don't see any other comments or questions in the chat room. Um, all right, thanks a lot team for the presentation there. With that, we will move to line E, the social studies six through eight resource adoption. Do I have um, a motion uh, and then um, support and then we'll have discussion on it. Can someone make a motion? I can't make a motion. Just, I, I just don't have the language in front of me. It's, to... uh, it's yeah, uh, it's on the agenda. It's right under E. Yeah, I'm um, just furiously. Last time I <laughs> found tabs, I, I exited this meeting. So I have it. I'll no, make no, it. Okay. 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 I move that the Board of Education adopt the social studies grades six through eight resource as presented on April 30th and approve the revised price quote in the amount of uh, $129,522.10 as attached. Do I have support? Support. Okay. Um, I know we've discussed this in detail at other board meetings. Is there any discussion? I don't think we need a presentation from Pat um, or Learning Services. Okay. Uh, with that, I will do a um, a roll call vote. Uh, Lisa. Yeah. Pass. Mark? Yeah, I, I mean, I made the motion, so. <laughs> okay. I... <laughs> All right, Mark. Paul, 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 Sarah just did a question mark. Um, Sarah, do you want to say something? No, it was about languages. Oh, okay. Um, is that Mark? Yes. Cynthia. Yes. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Jackie. Yes. Yes. I'm a yes. Uh, motion passes. Seven zero. Okay. With that, um, I'll move. Just give a quick update. Uh, the um, student um, intern uh, committee has met. We've gone through a numerous amount of candidates. We went through it. We narrowed it down. 
from that, from that, we were presented with a video from a various amount of candidates. Um, from that, um, um, and the committee is made up of myself, Lisa, Jennifer, and Pat. From that, uh, we went through those, narrowed it down further where we are right now. And everyone, I know all of my colleagues on the board have ad access to the files, the videos. Um, we are down to our final candidates. And on the 16th and 18th, um, the committee will be interviewing uh, the final candidates. We have a list of between five and 10 questions. We're going to narrow it down. And everyone has about, all of our final candidates will have about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, there'll be a Google um, Meet, which will be recorded. Um, everyone, again, will have access to, to all of those and our, you know, your input, um, just like some of you have done in the past, um, will be appreciated. And then we'll, we'll pretty much make our recommendation. So um, with that, I just want to give an update. Does anyone have any questions or comments? You know, one thing I will say, we've had enormous amount of talent out there, as, as all of you know, in our student body. Um, and then, you know, the videos itself and the application. So it was a very hard task. And we spent a significant amount of time going through that to come to where we are at this point. Okay. With that, um, there's one more thing, the school funding resolution. Uh, do, um, do I have a motion? This was presented to us uh, in terms of, an, and it goes in line with what Tina presented to, you know, obviously, you know, where we are with a budget gap. Uh, does it, anyone want to make a motion? It's on the agenda as well. I can make the motion, Paul. Okay. I move that the Bluefield Hills Schools Board of Education adopt the resolution in supporting the passage of legislation by the U.S. Congress appropriating needed funds to be distributed to the states and local districts with maximum flexibility to fill budget gaps during the state of emergency caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Support of the resolution? Support. Okay. Uh, just quick roll call, Cynthia. Aye. Okay, Mark, you supported it. Do I assume you're an aye? aye. Um, Lisa? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. Jackie? Aye. Howard, I assume, since you're ready. Aye. And I'm aye. Motion passes. Um, for our technology people, is there any public comment? No public comment. Okay, with that, I will call for adjournment. Thank you, everybody.